Let's do a few neck rolls. Let's do a few neck rolls. Let's relax. Nobody's doing it with me. All right. I'll go ahead and pass this off. Come on up, Matthias, and let's talk about React. Thank you, Diego. Amazing. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Matthias Tarasiewicz, and I'm from Riot, from the Riot Institute, and I want to explain you a little bit about what we are doing and uh, what also we try to do here with the cluster at the C3. So uh, I will introduce a little bit uh, Riot itself. So uh, we're an institute, that means we're an NGO, um, and we are, are doing research, development, communication, and education in the fields of cryptography, privacy technologies, and um, the future of decentralization. That's the mission, the basic uh, mission of Riot, so to say. We have an office and lab uh, in Austria. We have a few um, different groups which work um, across Europe, mostly Europe, um, one smaller group in uh, the US. And we have, um, in a way, a lot of decentral ways of working together already since uh, 2012. Um, and um, as I said, we have an NGO structure. That means um, we're trying um, to work and educate people around the topics of privacy and uh, decentralization since quite some while already. Uh, and we've uh, been through all these kind of blockchain hypes and so on, and we are still existing, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, so we are also trying to um, advance this, these topics because um, especially if you remember these kind of um, blockchain hype times and ICO hype times, like there was a lot of like shallow discussion in this whole uh, field. I think there's like a lot mm -hmm. more to gain from the technology still, if you understand it better. So um, maybe to explain a little bit more of the organization then. So we exist in 2012 and it's a kind of a, um, I would say not a merger because it's not a commercial thing. So um, we have been um, kind of um, integrating different groups we have been uh, having to the, uh, before. So that was, um, for example, the group Artistic Bokeh, which was uh, looking into like different camera hacks and like advancing camera technologies, DSLR hacks and so on. Um, then we had the group Supernet, who was existing. It was existing since um, early 2003. It was a kind of an artistic group running a large um, exhibition space uh, in Vienna, mainly. Uh, and we or also organized and started the Coded Cultures Initiative back then. This was all um, around like 2004, 2005. And this all got merged into Riot. And so this explains a little bit why we have this kind of artistic background as well. So um, this is our labs and our offices, how they look uh, when they are empty. I just found images when they are empty, actually but for people to see. Um, so this is in Austria and Vienna. And this is, um, yeah, this is when there's some setup. So here you see some um, funny um, small exhibition featuring some DAO punching machine where you could punch the, the creators of the DAO physically in this kind of boxing machine. So um, yeah, here you see a snapshot of one of our workshop areas. So um, in this case, it's also the, the right uh, hardware lab where we're working. So it looks a bit messy, but I, I kind of like this photo. And um, here you see a map of, um, where we try to map a little bit what uh, was achieved by Riot, but also in a kind of an Austrian, uh, um, it's not meant nationalistic, it's like more, um, there's this kind of Austrian shape in the background. So um, just a bit to explain also why I, I chose this, this, this image now to explain a little bit Riot. So um, for us, we somehow went through all this hype. So there's, uh, you see very good the, the kind of um, um, blockchain search time hypes on the um, bottom of, the, of this image. And at, at the same time, there were, um, in my opinion, this shows also how the, the whole, um, shift has happened in this kind of cryptocurrency space and in this kind of decentralization space because in the beginning it was a very much DIY-led and, and community-led uh, process. The whole thing was very much um, undertaken by individuals or like small groups or people that really wanted to change something. In my opinion, this, this, this changed a lot in 2016, 2017 when we saw this commercialization on this kind of heavy hype of, of blockchain. At the same time, uh, me personally, I was not so fascinated by this kind of hype uh, momentum, but more at, uh, when there was a uh, kind of a grassroots element to it and when um, there was a specific um, um, change that, uh, that was promised that all this kind of decentralization, decentralization could bring us. So um, in a way, um, it's interesting on this image also to see that um, there's a lot of like uh, meetups we started. So also to explain what Riot does, we do a lot of like um, um, physical meetings. Like um, people are um, in a way um, also discussing different technologies, um, learning from each other. And um, in this way, also the program at the cluster is very much related to what we are doing. So we are mainly working um, in these three fields, which is open hardware, privacy and anonymity, and coded cultures, which is this kind of term with, that we created um, um, with um, with these other art groups um, back in 2009 when we had a festival with the same name, which tried to bring hacker culture and, um, and technological culture closer together in the, in the field of art, artistic domain. So um, 
These are also the three labs that we currently run at Riot. So there's the Riot Open Hardware Lab, the Artistic Technology Lab, and the Future Crypto Economics Lab. And I want to give a, a brief insight in what these labs do. So to start with the Riot Open Hardware Lab, uh, and there's also people from the lab here. So um, you will also see in the next days a few um, elements in the program and in the workshops uh, around open hardware. So um, we started working with this project, which is the Apertus Axiom uh, open source cinema camera. Um, quite some while ago. We're still a little bit working with them, but not so closely anymore. This was an, uh, a Horizon 2020 project that we, um, that we did back in, I think it was like 2016 or something. Uh, and there's also a talk of mine from 32C3 um, about the project, in case you didn't see it yet, where I explained like, what are the challenges in open hardware projects, um, how documentation becomes a necessary element that is often overlooked, and what are all these kind of elements that are um, that would make up a successful open hardware project. The funny thing is in an open hardware project, um, they usually don't have a business model. So it was also interesting to, for us to understand like how they work. So still I'm very fascinated on the different elements of um, open hardware projects. And we're also tackling this in the, in the, uh, within our lab. So this is like one um, good example of a publication that we're doing. So we're doing multiple publications also from the labs. This is a little bit older one, this is from 2016, but um, this has already a few more vo volumes um, of it. It's called Openism Conversations in Open Hardware. Uh, and we started to um, investigate a little bit uh, qualitatively how different open hardware projects um, work, what do, do they understand um, um, about open hardware, so what are they opening? Is it what, how Libre is the hardware that is actually presented? And um, we got uh, quite a bunch of people together um, that um, we interviewed and we published in a very nice book that you can also um, here see in our info table. And um, we love to also make an interview with you about your open hardware project in case you're in this domain. Um, specifically, I was um, fascinated in um, getting to know these projects a little bit better in this regard and also to understand what are the different motivations. So, um, for, example, for example, David Cortielis, um, you might know as uh, one of the inventors of the Arduino board. Arduino still is one of the most important um, open hardware projects because they, they figured out a way um, um, how to basically um, I mean, the, the model is pretty, pretty nice. Uh, it did a lot to the maker movement. It was very important. But also at the same time, um, there's a lot of um, potential that is untouched still with open hardware. So for example, um, also this book, we, made a, um, um, we got a very nice um, text basically um, talking about um, if there could be something like a return of investment um, calculated with open hardware project. So. Um, there's a lot of different approaches to open hardware in there, and we are also continuing this series. So uh, please get in contact with us, or if you want to have one of these books, they are on our info table. Um, in this context, also the Riot Open Hardware Lab, uh, we'll have a few workshops here at the, um, at the cluster. So we will run one workshop tomorrow. Um, we don't have too many seats because this is like based on the, on the specific hardware that we, we brought with us. So um, get in touch with us if you're interested in joining there. So the idea here is to look at the Trezor CryptoLib and to see how um, this is actually functioning and how, what we can learn from it. So Trezor CryptoLib is, in my opinion, very important in terms of open hardware because um, Trezor is a very nice uh, open hardware piece. So in the, it's a, you all know the Trezor device possibly. What's nice about it is that the software is very good documented. You can port it on another device as well, so you don't have to run it on your own Trezor. If you're very paranoid, you can um, create the MC MCU, you can rebuild everything. Um, and we are trying to um, see um, what can we learn from the Trezor CryptoLib, how good is it documented, what kind of different crypto workflows can we get with simple devices that are not that uh, um, fast as uh, uh, usual uh, crypto accelerated devices. Um, we, are, um, we are working with here with a simple thing, which is um, basically the Arduino IDE. So the idea is like people can, with the Arduino IDE, develop different, um, very simple cryptographic primitives. They can learn from the cryptographic um, uh, workflows, and they can use it in their projects. So that's what we will be uh, starting tomorrow. To give you a short insight also on the artistic, artistic Technology Lab, this is a little bit over, um, intersecting with the term that I said before, with the coded cultures term. So um, for me, this whole started. This whole lab uh, um, started um, with the Coded Cultures Festival that we organized from 2004 until 2011. I think there was one issue also in 2015. It was a large festival like bringing like hacker culture and um, different artistic communities together in a large exhibition space usually, and this was uh, also including um, workshops which took place all over the year. So there was a very um, 
uh, in-depth book we created for um, one year almost. Um, this was released in 2011 and this is called uh, Coded Cultures, New Creative Practices Out of Diversity, where we're looking specifically at um, Japanese um, um, hacker culture, like Jap Japanese device culture and um, their approach to openness, but also their artistic approaches. And this got me like thinking, um, um, because what was interesting also in this regard was to see that um, a lot of these um, developments, um, there's even a, um, a, ter a term for that in, 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 um, in Japanese, it's called Shindogo, the unuseless objects. You have all these kind of, kind of interesting non-commercial, like, like anti um, 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 consumerist devices in, in, in open hardware communities or like anti-consumer uh, production approaches, which I found interesting. And so I dug deeper into that. So that became the Artistic Technology Lab, which was an actual lab which we installed at a uh, design university in, in Austria and Vienna. So also at the same time, like a little bit at the time um, of ending this book, um, um, the, this, this lab started to create the Bitcoin Cloud, uh, which was the very first Bitcoin-related art piece. This was um, it's maybe um, also often overlooked because the website is not up again, <laughs> still. So um, you can find it on archive.org still, uh, um, an old website of that. And uh, maybe to show you some pictures uh, um, and the maybe funny ideas behind it. So um, it was um, actually the most inefficient mining rig ever built because people would only mine if they would watch the art piece. We put some sensors in there and um, basically um, it was a stupid idea back at the time because, um, I mean, would we have minded, we would have uh, a lot of Bitcoins, but back in this um, uh, time when Bitcoin was a little bit below a dollar, it seemed like a reasonable idea. And Bitcoin was good, actually, in order to make the point that art has this kind of speculative momentum because the artistic object also is like, a, why, why is something worth that, man, that much? It's like really, it was interesting because it was fascinating to us how value it gets actually created in, uh, in, in art uh, production, like in art pieces. And so we tried to, to work in, uh, in this um, direction. So this um, had various iterations. So we had um, around, I think, like eight versions of the art piece and was traveling uh, all over the world. We had this shown in multiple uh, places. And um, there's also still a, um, a summary about the project if you're interested. We have also still the, the code and everything. It's super outdated, super old Bitcoin version, but it's still, still up there. But um, this also um, is interesting because I wanted to um, show you a more recent approach that we um, took now with all these kind of different artifacts that we collected throughout the years. So um, starting from the Bitcoin Cloud, we started to collect a lot of like different pieces from the, um, I would say, larger crypto sphere. We collected a lot of like uh, early prototypes from hardware devices. We, um, as you can see here on the image, for example, there's um, one of the switchboards of the Bitcoin Cloud that we hand etched and everything. Um, then there's, uh, for example, um, um, manipulated um, different devices that we just kept, uh, or like old versions of devices, all different sorts of like um, um, devices around cryptography and art that we are collecting and that we are uh, putting in something that we call the decentral process of uh, decentral um, archive of process artifacts. So this is something the the, the lab also creates, and we have a um, very large. Uh, Archive until now. There will also be a publication coming out in uh, February of next year, where we will explain a little bit the background of it, and we will showcase a few of these of these devices. So last year, if um, somebody was here at the cluster, you saw possibly a few of our devices from the from the lab, which we brought with us last year. So this is another thing that is um, produced by the Artistic Technology Lab. This is the Journal for Research Cultures, which is an academic publication which um, is currently published annually. There is like three different um, new uh, Editions coming out, so um, you can find um, this online. It's an open access journal. It's called Journal for Research Cultures, and um, currently there's one issue out, but we are planning to uh, launch three different issues uh, in the next year. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the Future Crypto Economics Lab, which is a more recent lab. So we started this actually in 2016 as part of, uh, of Riot as well. So um, you might have seen this um, newspaper that we um, also have at our info table that we, can, uh, that we give out to people for, uh, free of cost. So if you're interested, um, please come to us, then you can of course get one of those issues. So uh, continuing this idea of the publication that I showed before of this uh, open hardware dialogues, we somehow mapped this um, as a kind of a general method uh, for us to learn and to explore different projects. So we started to get in touch with all the different um, projects that we found interesting in the wider scope of crypto economics or 
I would say not only crypto economics, but uh, distributed systems. And we try to understand um, the different design approaches of decentralized systems. We try to understand what are the different motivations of the players. So, for example, in this issue, which is the first issue of this of this magazine, uh, and there's like four more to come also next year. Um, we made a lot of different interviews with, for example, Vitalik Buterin, or people that made this kind of cryptographic uh, decentralized system that we have today. But um, we are also trying to um, understand um, a little bit the limitations of this kind of um, utopian visions or these different visions that are somehow um, put into place there in software. So for example, you have heard of this kind of term of the immutable code, unstoppable code with Ethereum. This was, for example, um, largely um, um, stopped or like not being the case after the DAO fork. Um, I don't know if most of you people know that, but these are all elements which, which showed um, me that um, this huge topic of decentralization is more a kind of a, a promise than it is an actual fact. So we are very far away from actual decentralization when we look also where our data is, um, uh, what kind of network censorship we have these days. So uh, in my opinion, um, it's important to stay sharp here, and this is how, why we created this kind of format, uh, which is uh, published in the magazine. Um, so uh, you can also, um, if you want the digital copy, just uh, uh, mail us or let us know. you find more information on it on the Riot website. And you can, of course, also uh, meet us here at the cluster and talk to us. So a lot of people of us are here. Um, I won't go into too much detail about um, um, what we did with the cluster and how, how we envisioned this specific setting of different people meeting, because there will be another um, small um, introduction that uh, Diego and me will be giving about the program, which will be, I guess, in one hour or so. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening and um, I'm happy to also answer any questions if there are any.